Thank you all for joining me today and uh, for hosting this uh, digital estimating presentation with OEL. Uh, we're going to be going over uh, digital estimating for electrical contractors, a um, bunch of different uh, <coughs> techniques that we can use, uh, different pieces of software that we can use, and what to look for in the software when you're selecting a platform for your estimating needs. First up, we'll go through an introduction, then uh, the life of a bid, some historical estimating uh, methodologies, things that were done, uh, some advantages for going digital and uh, best practices, and some advice on selecting a software platform for your estimating. A brief introduction. Uh, my name is Melvin Newman. I have been doing this uh, for over 15 years as an estimator through a number of different companies. Started my career in Ottawa with uh, Black and McDonald. Um, worked with Modern Niagara, then uh, did a stint with Acon, and then uh, was uh, working with Trotter Morton when I uh, founded the Padabid platforms that. Uh, we operate as a electrical estimating platform and it started to take off and basically working two full-time jobs became a little bit much and so made the choice to commit full-time to pad a bit and uh, continue to develop that. Uh, we started developing the actual quantify platform, the estimating platform in 2020 with a goal to significantly improve on the time it takes to do an estimate um, through aggressive automation, use of machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence in there. And we will be covering some of that in here, what it is and what it isn't. Um, so yeah, that's a, a bit about uh, myself. So let's dive in here. The life of a bid. So what is the the life of estimating. I love estimating. I am overly enthusiastic about it. Um, absolutely love the game. It's basically the most amazing poker game. Um, so, you know, figuring out the strategy, figuring out the other people at the table. But the life of the bid, it all starts with finding. So you have to find that opportunity. Now this can be highly relational. Um, so, you know, working with general contractors, especially in the private sector, you have to identify the contractors, the clients, the owners, um, get on their bid lists. There's a lot of kicking down doors, you know, getting face-to-face -face meetings. For some of the, the prime, you know, builders and such, there is a, a tremendous amount of effort to be given a shot at a project. And then, you know, you gotta make sure that you hit it out of the park to stay on those bid lists. Then there's the public sector, so municipalities, state sources, you know, provincial, um, various different tender sites. You got bids and tenders, you've got Mercs, Bidingo, all of these different sources that you have to monitor if you're in that kind of public procurement sphere. And that can be a whole separate uh, situation. They're just trying to find the, the correct opportunities to bid. Then we get into quantifying the estimate. So this is where you start the meat and potatoes of it putting together the counts, uh, validating everything, doing your risk analysis, preparing the packages for quotes, getting your lighting out, getting your distribution out first thing, all of these bits and pieces that take up a tremendous amount of time and effort as you start to get into an estimate. Uh, identifying all the individual scopes and effectively ensuring that you're not missing anything and you engage the rest of the market in the estimate. And there's, it, it all depends on the scale. You know, if you're doing custom homes or renovations or something of that nature, there's probably just a couple of suppliers that you need to go to. As you start to get into schools or institutional work, you're starting to get into some major lighting packages, major distribution. And then if you get into major institutions, you know, working on university campuses or in hospitals or those sort of things, there is a tremendous amount of gear and lighting and pieces that go into that. And then you get into industrial and it's just a whole nother ball game with, you know, major cable runs, ladder tray, all of those bits and pieces that you have to identify 
count and pull together and then close out so this was the day that i always love the most i love the day of closing when all the chaos starts to kick on you know um <clears throat> your everybody's adrenaline's going uh things might be falling apart things will be coming together you know there's a little bit of everything in that closing day the quotes start coming in they're usually you know the last hours when everything's coming in getting your sub trades on board getting their quotes in and then risk figuring out and finalizing the risk and it all changes on the day of closing you know what you may have planned for may not be going as per plan especially if you're into kind of larger projects um, day of closing in you know major municipal institutional projects something's always kind of blowing up or doing something and it's just a, a, a lot of chaos but if you've planned the estimate well it's really well managed chaos in the private sector it's uh, unless you're getting into very large uh, private projects it, it can be a little less um, chaotic and definitely better planned out but there's still everything that you have to wrap together to get that final price over to the client historical estimating the process the bid opportunity arrives whether that's you know a, a fax that came in uh, a phone call that came in um you know the details uh, start to come in the drawings are printed so this can always be a major issue uh, especially on kind of mid-size to larger projects it can just take a lot of time to print drawings um, if you if you have to do you know 24 by 36 drawing sets that's got to be sent out to a print shop for that and it just takes a long time and then the specs have to be printed out sharpen up your pencil crayons and start to do the takeoff um, you know packages have to be prepped and gotten out uh, again this you know back in the day used to be uh, a fax kind of situation these days it's still more you know email but you still have to pull apart the specs assemble it into its individual components and then get that out to the suppliers and then you can start to get into counting things if you're on the pen and paper methodology that's going to be tick sheets or something similar you get your clicker out you get your scale x out and you start to go to town on the drawings and start to literally just count highlight mark things up and that is incredibly time consuming to simply count things and then once you're done all of those counts you have to tabulate that and put it together and extend it and this is another massive time uh, consumer labor costing all of that is manually applied the very first estimate that i ever did uh, when i was starting out um, junior estimator sat down in my cubicle it was week one in estimating the <coughs> chief estimator came over dropped about a hundred uh, takeoff sheets handed me a red book for the pricing a labor manual for the labor a calculator and a pencil and he said go I thought it was nuts but nope he was serious had to flip open the labor manual pencil in the unit labors extend everything out by hand it was incredibly labor intensive to perform and then you have to apply any factors for your closeout and calculate everything and then hope it all comes together um, again when I first started out what we would do in our closeout three of us would sit down we would have the manager the chief estimator and whoever else one other person who was standing by each with a calculator and we would be key mashing those calculators I mean this is happening like 10 15 minutes to closing somebody sitting in the parking lot on the phone you know just screaming for the numbers and we would not submit until two out of the three people had come up with the same number and then you know we took a wild guess and hoped that you know 60 percent chance that we were correct and that's what we would submit and you know uh, run with that so very error prone very time consuming a couple of estimates that you know i've always found just amazing number one the apollo space mission you know kennedy stepped up and said we're going to the moon literally nobody had been to the moon before um there you know we knew it was there 
but nobody had ever been there before. So the original estimate was done in 1961. It came in from all of the engineers and estimators in NASA at, they figured between nine and $12 billion. James Webb was the administrator of NASA at that time. Probably know the James Webb tel telescope. It's named after him. Uh, literally, as he was basically walking into the White House, he looked at the number and said, you know, we have never done anything close to this. We have no idea what we don't know. And he doubled the number. And he put it down in front of Kennedy and said, it's going to take $20 billion. And keep in mind, this is like 1960s dollars. $20 billion, and this is what we're going to do. And of course, you know, Kennedy said, well, we're going to do it. The final cost for the program came in at $25.4 billion and gave us just a wild amount of technology today that was just not even envisioned when these first estimates were put together. And just a crazy history there on how that came together and really the estimators that made it somewhat possible um, <clears throat> so that they knew what sort of what they were walking into even though nobody had any idea what they were walking into. Then the other one was the Hoover Dam. Originally estimated in 1930, estimated to be $49.9 million. Six companies got together in a massive joint venture because nobody had built anything like this before. But these companies stepped up and said, you know what, we're going to do this. So they, they bid the job, they figured it was going to be $49.9 million. The final cost came in at $49 million. So almost a million dollars under budget. Fairly unheard of in construction, but they managed to do it. And two years ahead of schedule, which was kind of the, the really amazing part of what they managed to pull off there. Building something unheard of before and still running today. <clears throat> Advantages of digital estimating, fully integrated. This is a massive advantage to digital estimating. Everything is, is there for you. So you've got your labor units, you've got your pricing units, all pre-populated in the database so that all the calculations are automated. And this is probably one of the most massive time savers. Over pen and paper, you're talking like a 300% uh, reduction in time on an estimate um, and that's just kind of the, the industry benchmark for going from pen and paper into digital you've got everything attached back to your takeoff so in a properly integrated environment if it's marked up on the drawings it is in the estimate everything is linked back to the source material and that makes such a huge difference for auditing for understanding what's gone into the estimate and for turnover. Easy to submit layouts. So if you're drafting something in your estimating platform, you know, um, you've put together, especially in design build or in, you know, custom home or anything of that nature, um, you've got to submit this back to the client for approval. Well, now in a fully integrated digital estimating environment, you draw it in, the system backfills the estimate for you you submit that layout with your quote and it is full clarity, full transparency to the client or to the team. If you're on something, a, a larger design build, all of this goes to the team and it's ready to go. Everybody understands what's being worked on. All the information is centralized. So this is critical, especially if you're in any sort of team environment. And let's be honest, we're all in some sort of team environment here. If you're, you know, a residential contractor, your team are your site people. You've got to get the information about what you bid into their hands also so they can build it per the bid. And that's absolutely critical, that chain of knowledge that goes from end to end so that what was bid on is what gets built. No more, no less. That way the owner understands what's coming, the team in the field knows what to put together and all of this has been included in the estimate easy backup and reference this is becoming more and more relevant as your company grows and again it doesn't matter what size of company construction generates a phenomenal amount of data data is gold 
So again, it doesn't matter if, you know, residential contractor up to multinational, you know, Black and McDonald size of contractor. All of that data, accessing it, centralizing it, ensuring that it is um, collated together and assembled so that you can act on it. You can understand what your company is doing, what the market is doing. Multi-user estimating. Now this is, uh, again, when you get into kind of those team projects, um, absolutely essential uh, to have everybody working from the same set of data. And that can be a massive issue if you've got, you know, a couple of estimators dedicated to a project, but they're working on different sets of drawings, you know, different addenda come out, one person cuts them into the drawings, the other kind of has them sitting off to the side, you know, stuff gets missed when that happens. In multi-user estimating, everyone works from the same set of drawings. Multi-trade engagement, getting, you know, if you're an MEP contractor, or if you're, you know, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, if you're a combined shop or with prefabrication, all of this uh, can be brought together into one estimating platform. AI and machine learning in estimating. So this is, this is a fun topic. Um, absolutely near and dear to my heart, you know, uh, I started developing AIs back in 2018 just to automate certain pieces of my day-to-day -day work as an estimator. Um, <clears throat> really key for risk analysis, that kind of stuff, um, understanding <clears throat> where things have gone wrong before, well, you can teach an AI that. You can teach an AI to look for certain things, especially with the natural language processing systems out there and AIs out there. That was the, the very first one that I had built personally was for natural language processing. And it was simply there to read the tender documents and extract things that had burned the companies I had worked for before. Liquidated damages, schedules, all of those pieces pulled out and assembled into a just a list of you know those gotchas that have happened this is a massive strength of ai that ability to read through very very quickly um, i benchmarked uh, the ai against my colleague once um, we were supposed to make a go no go decision on a project um, he spent about three or four hours reading through all the documents came over to to me and said hey can you do a uh, a second pass at this and see, you know, if you come up with the same things. I dragged the documents onto the AI, grabbed a coffee, came back a minute later, and it had found everything that he had found. Basically identically highlighted the PDFs, handed it back and said, here's the, the situation. Um, he was very angry at me for, <laughs> for doing that and uh, for him not, you know, wasting hours and hours <laughs> in the day for that. And so that sort of thing is where AIs have an incredible strength to bring to the table. Things that AI are not, it cannot replace the estimator. AIs are really fantastic averaging engines. So they take just a monstrous amount of data and they average it. And that data is separated out, it is averaged and then you know, you can ask it questions and it will pull from its knowledge base. This, is a, this can be seen vividly with uh, ChatGPT. So if you're, you know, tinkering around with ChatGPT and you ask it something specific about your location, you know, in your local area, something specific, it will fall down. It simply is averaging data from the whole world effectively and then giving back answers on that. So AIs cannot know your local conditions. The AI will never be calling your suppliers. The AI will not be able to find necessarily the most optimal routing for something through a building that is also per code. AIs can do fantastic things for um, finding optimal routes, for finding optimizations, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's legal to build it that way. So. You have to, for example, you know, the shortest path between a panel and a plug might be through a load bearing column. That's just something that, you know, an AI would be able to pick up and say, yeah, you could go ahead and drill a hole through that. 
and it would be a shorter path, uh, but the building might fall down. So, you know, um, half a dozen of one. But uh, that's kind of where AIs can never replace that human knowledge and human touch. We're in construction, we are building things for humans by humans. And so the AIs are an incredibly powerful tool to reduce time and to accelerate things, and they are becoming essential assistants. But when it comes to construction, they are not there to replace the human. And they also have to have data there to work with. So again, if you're in design build or pulling something together on, you know, the back of a napkin for somebody who's got, you know, an idea and you're trying to do high level budgeting to get this project rolling, they're not there yet. And it's debatable about whether they will ever get there. Because even if you can train an AI on all things electrical, it won't know the local code. It won't know the conditions about, you know, what something in Texas is allowed to be built for versus what something in Canada is allowed to be built for. And we have extremely different um, codes and requirements for our projects. So yeah, that's that's kind of where the, the strengths and weaknesses of uh, AI can kind of apply in the estimating process. Tremendous for reading in large quantities of documents, tremendous for counting things like symbols and you know data on a drawing and starting to connect those dots, but really there to do the grunt work. The AI cannot call your suppliers and negotiate for better pricing on a strategic project. They can't build partnerships. There is, n you're just never gonna replace the human in those situations. Best practices for takeoff. So when you're taking off uh, a project digitally, there's a few things to pay close attention to. The number one, ergonomics. This is one thing that is overlooked time and time again when people start to go into digital estimating. A lot of people I've talked to who have ditched digital estimating and said basically, nope, doesn't work. It all comes down to the screen size. Basically, nothing else matters. When you look at a 24 by 36 inch drawing, it is 24 inches by 36 inches. If you're trying to replicate that on a 13 to 15 inch laptop screen, it's just not going to work. Uh, so the number one thing that I always did, and you can see it up in these pictures here, a massive screen. And this doesn't have to be anything super high end. The key requirement is 48 inch screen with 4K resolution. You don't need a smart TV, you don't need any of that kind of stuff, um, but 48 inch 4K screen is critical. The 48 inch at the 16 by nine ratio that modern TVs and screens come in means that you can see a 24 by 36 inch drawing in one to one scale on that screen. And the 4K resolution is close to what the eye can see. So you will not have to be zooming in and out to read text on this. You can see all the notes, you can have the entire context of what you're looking at in front of you exactly the same as if you were on a piece of paper. And that is hugely critical. The computer doesn't matter, the rest of it really doesn't matter. Um, when I've set this up for my teams, you know, people always be coming in saying, oh, you're not supposed to sit that close to the, the, a TV and all this kind of stuff. And they're not wrong. You should never sit that close to a TV when there's action on it. When things are moving around, it will cause massive eye strain. But when you're looking at a 2D drawing, nothing is moving around. It is static. It is exactly the same as looking at a piece of paper. So the key part here is 48 inch 4K screen. Set that up in there and then you can see everything on your drawings one to one and you can get the entire context of what you're working on. Uh, I like to set up a separate kind of 24, 27 inch monitor, just a, a regular run of the mill monitor, but I like to put it in vertical mode in these stations 
so that you can you know have all the other things on there like specifications and you can see multiple pages at a time that way it just makes reading and uh, correlating the spec to the drawings a lot easier um, also you can just have your emails or whatnot there and then a third monitor that just kind of sits there and collects everything else that you may be working on at that time strongly recommend a minimum of two monitors three monitors is nice but might be getting a little bit much um, but the number one thing is make sure you get that minimum 48 inch 4k screen in the middle it will also totally change the way you look at everything else in construction absolutely fantastic for schedules um, and review of 3d models that sort of thing uh, if you're into kind of those those bigger projects uh, selecting a PDF viewer and editor, I mean, a common one out there is Bluebeam um, or Adobe. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, make sure that whatever you've got there is a good PDF editor. Again, strongly recommend selecting a estimating platform that has all of that built in. Review the project and plan plan from the very beginning how you're going to execute this estimate that is absolutely essential to a successful day of closing start the planning for the close the day that the documents arrive uh, one of the things that we always like to do in the the groups that i was in was do a, a page flip so basically we would take the drawings lay it out on a table or you know flip it up on the screen um you know get the drawings there and we would call everyone over so you know chief estimator admin assistant whoever was walking by get them all in the cubicle look at the drawings flip through everything then everybody would write down the number of what they thought the job was worth on a sticky note put it on a wall and then we would go do the estimate and whoever was closest to that uh, sticky note you know would get something at the end of the project if we won the job uh, they would, you know, we'd all go out for a meal and, you know, uh, we would get a, a meal out. If we lost a job, you know, the person closest might get a bottle of water or something. But uh, the key here is get a feel for the project before you do anything on it and plan for that day of closing. Select a breakdown strategy. That is essential to planning for that day of closing. Decide how you're going to break out this project um, decide how you're going to generate all the closing documentation. So this could be, you know, the owner has a tender form. Um, obviously, the, the, there's all the drawings in the package. Then you might want to break out by system. And I was always an advocate for putting all the breakdowns in. If the platform you were using had an option for that breakdown, we would use it. Um, it would seem, at least initially, you know, like this was extra wasted effort. But the one day that the owner comes back and says, hey, I need to see this a bit of a different way because, and it doesn't matter what that because is, usually it's because something's over budget, um, but you can generate that breakdown in minutes instead of hours and days having to go back and reevaluate everything. So always put as much in your breakdowns as you possibly can. And set the corporate colors, symbols, markups, all of those kind of things in your platform whatever you're using for your digital estimating make sure that everybody's doing it exactly the same way this is another view of uh, one of the stations so a three monitor setup again you know large screen in the middle um, one other little side gig the mouse um, again this is a bit of a personal thing but uh, I always love to get one of the gaming um, MMO mice so these mice have you know 20 buttons on them and I would hotkey those buttons to functions in the estimating platform and it was amazing how much faster you can bid on work when you just do everything from the mouse and keyboard and um, you know put all of your hotkeys for different items different things attached to the mouse and so that's just a, a little side gig, you know, it's kind of going overboard, but uh, whenever I was setting these stations up, I always got, you know, um, one of the, the high-end gaming mice for 
whoever I was working with. And uh, it was always fascinating, you know, in a team of five estimators, you get them all these gaming mice and they will all configure them, you know, slightly differently for all their hotkeys. And then watching somebody try to swap mice was always really funny. Uh, and then c carry on. <clears throat> Best practices for review and summarizing the project. Again, review it from a high level. So, you know, break things down by drawing. And that was always one of the, the key ones that we did, you know, separate out the values per drawing. So how much is each drawing worth on this project? And as you go through that, you'll see right away, okay, you know, I've got a drawing here that is, you know, a million dollars. When all the rest of my drawings are in the, like, $100,000 or less range, really, if we're honest, you know, what most of them will probably be in the $50,000 range if you've got one in a million dollars. And that stands out immediately. Okay, why is that drawing, why is that part of this project so expensive? Is it really that expensive or did we accidentally move a decimal place on something and, you know, carry a thousand, hundred thousand feet of cable when there was only supposed to be, you know, a thousand feet of cable. So it's a great way to quote unquote debug your estimate to see what everything is worth and should it be worth that. Um, does it make sense? Is the project balanced was always a term that I used, you know. Is there something that stands out or is it properly all laid out here? The next one is to sort by things that have zero dollars and zero hours. Any digital estimating platform will let you do this. This is something that is really only available in digital estimating platforms. Click on the top of the column for your material and your hours and sort and then go down the values there and see if it makes sense. Have I put pricing to everything that should be priced? Does everything have hours that should have hours? Now, this is a, a little bit of a murkier part there on the hours. It really depends on the labor you're using. For example, if you're using the Nika labor manual, it will have fundamentally different assumptions than the Suderman labor manual. If you're on the mechanical side of things, if you're using the NAPHCC manual, wildly different from the MCA manual. So understanding the foundation of the labor that you're using is absolutely critical because not everything necessarily should be labored. Some things like couplings is a big one. There's always tons and tons of couplings, especially in EMT runs. Um, depending on the labor manual you're using, they may or may not have to be labored. So it's critical to understand, does it make sense? Summarize the breakdowns. Again, this goes back to just checking, does everything balance out and does it make sense? And then check when the last update for your pricing was done. Ideally, something like real-time pricing is what you wanna have built in so that you can pull up to the minute pricing. Uh, but outside of that, did you update your database, you know, two weeks ago or two months ago? What's happened in the industry since then? Uh, since COVID-19, pricing has been in a world of turmoil. Pretty much there's always something that's going off the rails. So it's critical to get the, the last time the pricing was updated and understand where that was done and if it still makes sense. Best practices for closeout. Build your closeout structure early. Day one, start looking at how am I going to close this job? What is my end game going to look like? And how do I build for that playbook? Get your BOMs and scopes ahead of the quotes. This is, it's, you're pretty much never gonna get your pricing other than the day of closing on any sort of significant strategic project. If you're in the private sector and you know things are a little less chaotic, more prescribed, the owner has probably, to be honest, worked with the, the suppliers already and things will be pretty much nailed down, then it's it's nowhere near as you know big of a, an issue. 
Um, but when you're in kind of the, the major projects, things are held to the very last minute. It is absolutely essential to get your bills of materials and your scope letters ahead of time. Engage with the contractors, in, the subcontractors, engage with the suppliers. And so this is where all of our talk about AI and the time savings and all of that really comes into play here because it shifts the balance of what you're working on in the estimate. When uh, earlier on in my career, I ran some data analytics on the estimating process and I discovered in our mechanical electrical estimates, we would spend 80 to 90% of the time on those bids counting widgets. Those widgets by and large only contributed, you know, 25 to 30% of the final value of the bid. They all had to be counted, but we wasted a disproportionate amount of time on the lowest value parts of the estimate. So when you bring AI and automated counting and that sort of thing into that aspect, you can recover that time so that you can spend it now on engaging with the suppliers, engaging with the sub trades. And that is really where you get those scopes ahead of time. You can, again, refine your day of closing playbook, understand what the exclusions are from these suppliers. Don't get blindsided by a supplier who comes to you on the day of closing and says, actually, you know, those four critical light fixtures, there's a thousand of them in this building. Yeah, I can't supply you those. You know, those are sort of the blind sides that you really, really want to avoid. And the only way to do that is close, tight engagement with your suppliers, with your sub trades during the estimate. Pre-populate your estimate with guesses. Now, this doesn't really uh, apply to the summary, quote unquote, screen or the, you know, your, your B materials, your commodities. We're not really too worried about those here. What the, where this really kicks in is for your A materials, the quoted packages. Make sure when you're filling in your estimate, you populate guess numbers for those. Um, and same with your sub trades. Pre-populate every time you create one of these packages with a plug number. First of all, it will give you a, a sense of where the estimate is going to land very early on. You know, is this a $100,000 estimate, a $1 million estimate, or a $100 million estimate? Having those pre-plugged in numbers will give you a sense at where that is going in the estimate. And the reality is you're probably going to be high on half of them and low on the other half of them. So on that day of closing, as you start to fill the real numbers in, you'll start to notice the estimate circling around kind of a, a, a particular number. Um, you know, as, as things are getting plugged in, that number is getting more and more refined and it will give you a sense of comfort that you know where it's going. Um, the other thing that it helps you mitigate is in all of that chaos of closing, you're not gonna necessarily miss something entirely. <clears throat> you may miss that some quote for some, you know, pieces of instrumentation didn't come through, didn't come through in the way that you expected. But as long as you had a plug number in there, you know, as you're ripping through everything and you may miss that, you're not going to be out entirely. You know, <laughs> ideally, you'll be fairly accurate in these numbers when you're guessing from experience and whatnot. But at least you won't be at zero if you hadn't pre-populated something for, you know, these instruments. Auto samplers are one that just always comes to mind. You know, refrigerated auto samplers, psychotically expensive pieces of hardware. And when you look at it on the drawing, it's usually like one little tiny widget. And, you know, it's off in some corner everywhere. And that widget might be $20,000, might be $50,000, depending on what it is. And if you miss that and then miss it in all the quotes and didn't carry anything for it, that's a good chunk of money to be out. Um, the other one that I always loved was explosion proof water heaters. I did one project where the engineer specced out a, a wild explosion proof hot water heater for underneath a sink. And it came in at 25 odd thousand dollars. If he had moved it eight inches to the other side of the wall, so no longer in the explosion area, that thing would have been an $800 unit. 
So, <laughs> just things to, to watch out for and keep an eye on. Set alarms uh, on any of your guesses. So, any good software package will highlight for you when either a number's missing or let you highlight something as like, okay, I've put a plug number in here. So, when you're closing that estimate, you do a final quick run through, you can very quickly see what what plug numbers do I have left? Am I comfortable with those? Okay, let's go. Best practices for data storage. So this is one of the unique pieces of digital estimating. Store and keep everything always. Storage is cheap these days. Um, <clears throat> put as much into the estimate and into the estimating platform as possible so everything is linked back to those source materials. Uh, I like to recommend organizing by year. Uh, strongly advocate for that simply because you'll generally always remember the year in which you did something. Um, select a standard numbering scheme. So again, I always like to go, you know, 2024 001 for the first estimate and then carry on from there. Uh, simple standard numbering scheme makes it so much easier to find things uh, going back in into the past. Tagging your estimates and files with data. So for example, whenever I save a quote for something, you know, that lighting package comes in, I will always tag it lighting, you know, space dash space, um, the value of it, so $100,000 package, and then space dash space the name of the supplier and the reason for that is windows or mac os or any operating system will then automatically sort everything by me, for me by my package then by the number which is the value of that package then by the supplier that supplied that package so i can immediately see just without even opening anything up just by going into the quotes folder what the values were for pretty much all the core pieces on a project. And it just helps with pulling information out later on and justifying things. The low number may not have been the number you carried. Um, it may not have been complete, but at least you can see it very, very quickly and identify that information. Software selection. So this is where things get interesting. Cloud or local installation. Um, I strongly advocate for cloud native these days. Uh, again, that just reduces the workload on the company that is deploying this and managing the information. Um, and you know, a, if you're a large corporation with a massive IT department, then you know, hosting something internally much more feasible. Um, but if you're you know, kind of small to mid size. Uh, business, um, something cloud-based just significantly reduces management load and also all of the backup and security that goes with that. Store uh, files and documents in the estimate. So whatever platform you choose should allow you to attach all your files into the estimate. Built-in AI Assist. So again, Understanding that it's AI assisting. If somebody comes to you and says their estimating package will do the estimate for you, run, run far. Um, because accepting that at face value is going to potentially sink your company. Um, but it should have tools built into it that allow you to recoup a significant amount of that grunt labor on the estimate. Uh, estimating templates. It should allow you to create templates for your estimates um, on you know different sectors of work, different clients, but ways so that when you open an estimate with a template, it pre-populates everything for you. And then absolutely critical, it should have graphical takeoff built in. So there is no transferring of values manually. Everything must be tied back to the source documents so that you can ensure consistency in your estimates. Uh, <clears throat> automated takeoff, you know, something that can assist you in counting all of these widgets. Again, that goes kind of back to the, the AI side of things. An items and assemblies database ready to go. This will save you a tremendous amount of time, especially in the MEP sector. 
And those assemblies should be formula driven, simply so that you don't have to create a million of them for every different size. Uh, and it should be customizable to your business and multi-trade. I advocate for the multi-trade um, simply so that you can get the, the growth potential. You know, maybe you will never be a, a plumbing or HVAC or pipe fitting company, but it should be available in case that ever comes or you team up with someone and open up another division. So leaves room to grow. That should be built into the platform at the core. So in conclusion, digital estimating saves a ton of time, saves money. Uh, most importantly, it allows a massive increase in the volume of what you can bid and bid more accurately. Setting up the right ergonomics, the right workstation for your estimating is absolutely key. And then selecting the software that will grow with you. And then at the end, all of it is data, data, data storing and analyzing the data out of your estimates that turn into projects that loop back around once a project's completed, circle that back into your estimating so that you can close that loop and refine everything that you're working on in your company. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for hosting me today. That, in a nutshell, is the uh, <coughs> um, digital estimating presentation here. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Melvin at patabid.com is uh, my email address. And uh, really, really enthusiastic about estimating and love, love that chaos of the day of closing. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Take care.